name's Alexis Harmon, and I will be moderating today, as Harry just communicated. The last professor showdown was held just after Trump was elected, and now that we've just passed the 100-day mark, we thought it was a good time to hold another one. Not that much has happened. So, <laughs> with that said, I'm going to introduce the panelists. This is Professor David Andrus. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Next is Dr. Deems Morioni. Professor Nick Hernandez. <laughs> Dr. Majid Mosley. <laughs> and Dr. Phil Gusson. <laughs> so before we get started, I just wanted to lay out some basic guidelines so that you guys have an understanding of how the event is going to go. So the first portion of the event will be centered around pre-selected topics. I will read the question, generally with some context given, and whichever professor feels the urge to respond may do so. Ideally, professors, <laughs> around two minutes, and then about a minute to follow up. There is no obligation for every professor to respond to every question. <laughs> Only respond if you feel a desire to, although knowing how political you guys tend to be and opinionated you guys tend to be, I don't think we'll have a shortage of discussion. No. <laughs> um, after we're done with the topic, I'm going to be taking one or two audience questions, so be thinking while they're talking, and if you guys are interested in asking something, go ahead and raise your hand when I say that it's time. And on top of that, we will have 30 minutes about at the end for any and all audience questions. So, with that, are we ready to begin? Yeah. Fantastic. Well then, our first question is, Saturday marked President Trump's 100th day in office. Do you think, so far, Donald Trump has left a unique and permanent mark on the presidency? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what <are> you... <laughs> Uh, all presidents leave a mark on the presidency. Oh. All presidents leave a mark on the presidency. And most presidents evolve the power of the presidency. And the presidency, the executive branch, has continually evolved and is, uh, in practice, the most powerful branch. Uh, maybe not constitutionally, meaning the Supreme Court, obviously, and the judiciary has that supreme power. But in practical effect, um, the, the executive branch has expanded in power. Most presidents, when they take office, uh, they don't give that power back. They continue to expand it. Um, clearly, uh, in the short amount of time, uh, from my perspective, uh, President Trump has been uh, obviously very provocative, um, obviously uh, much uh, different in terms of bucking customs and traditions and so forth. Um, so uh, whether it's the kind of intersection of social media with Twitter um, and many of the other uh, avenues of, of communication and his style and his rhetoric and his policies and so forth, um, it, it does, you know, it does obviously uh, raise the question of what will the next president be left with in terms of stylistically uh, what they're able to do and what they want to do. As I told my class the other day, if I ran for president in 2020 and I used Donald Trump's tactics, I would be probably laughed out of the room because Donald Trump is a unique character that blends many different variables all into his kind of singular uh, approach as an individual. So um, I definitely think he's altered the presidency, uh, given our, the fact we have to brief, be brief in our comments. Um, you know, to what end remains to be seen, I could kind of project and elaborate, but uh, I defer it this time. <laughs> I'll be even more pithy. <laughs> I'll say I think Thanks. he's left a mark on the presidency <laughs> by bringing a wrecking ball to it. <laughs> uh, I think that's about what I'd like to say. I, said, I teed that up for you. <laughs> well, I, I certainly think that it's, uh, it's created more, obviously, divisiveness, right? I think most of us can agree that, that there is definitely a dividing line. So I think, and part of that has to do with his style, stylistically, to sort of piggyback on that. But uh, um, Wrecking Ball, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that, certainly. But um, yeah, and where, you know, sort of where it goes from here is, is yet to be seen, but building off of what's happened thus far, um, the next president, it's going to be interesting, especially with the campaigning uh, of the next election, how, how that's going to go given how this last campaign um, sort of uh, evolved. Um, so I think stylistically, the, that, that is the impression, just sort of this, the way things are done and, and the divisiveness that has been created is, is sort of the mark. 
of this president? Well, I, I tend to agree with some of the comments uh, that uh, my colleagues uh, have made so far. Indeed, uh, uh, the style that the current president has embraced is rather unique, and uh, uh, his style of uh, decision making and uh, uh, with regards to various aspects of domestic and international politics uh, are rather unconventional, to say the least. Uh, frankly, uh, I am still exploring uh, how the president, someone who's sitting at the office of the presidency, at the helm of the American presidency, actually makes important policy decisions that affect us domestically and globally. So uh, I'm quite... Uh, I'm still absorbing and digesting uh, as to which model of decision making the president has embraced for the kind of decisions, public policy decisions that he has made so far, and how this approach uh, is going to uh, impact uh, the course of uh, his, uh, his office and the uh, remainder of his term. Uh, which is another three and a half years, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, I remain cautiously optimistic uh, about the course of his presidency, but we shall see. It's all conjectural at this point. So. And then I'll go back to the wrecking ball. Um, <laughs> I think in many ways that the concerns that people had about Donald Trump being, uh, being president have borne themselves out. You have a man who is profoundly um, ignorant, Sorry, uh, Trump's words. Uh, profoundly incurious about the institution that he now leads, and that has created and will continue to create a number of problems. What has stood out for me thus far, and it's only 100 days, and so who knows what's going to happen, has been the resilience of the other institutions around him. In other words, our framers set up this system so that it could survive a bad president. And I'm not talking about his politics. I'm talking about what I would call his incompetence. And so what has happened is um, he has surrounded himself with some competent people. I think that there are some issues there. But he has surrounded himself with some competent people. The bureaucratic state and what he calls the deep state, the bureaucracy, career bureaucrats have tamped down some things. Congress has provided a check in, in many ways on what he's done. And so... Uh, and the states have actually stood up and taken a role in uh, checking some of the, what I would say, some of the less wise decisions. And the courts have stepped in as well. So on the one hand, um, there's been a lot of concern about what happens if you have a president who truly doesn't appreciate what the office is. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the, the institutions surrounding the presidency do have done their job thus far. Just a, a quick follow-up on that, and I, it, as it relates to the, the question of the, the permanent kind of altering of the presidency or the executive branch, I just, whether it's a wrecking ball now um, in the immediate, I, I, I'm not clear on what the next president after President Trump um, will do. Will they revert back to more conventional means? Will the unconventional nature of Donald Trump be itself um, kind of normalized into the new conventional kind of behavior of political kind of uh, attitudes and so forth. And so I, I do think that, um, a, as Dr. Gustin was pointing out, the re resiliency of the other institutions, um, is it possible that after Donald Trump leaves office that the executive branch itself reverts back to a certain customary rule um, because uh, his behavior is unique to him and he probably can get away with much of the unconventional attitude that he's put forth and many other people couldn't? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think it's really early uh, in his presidency to find out if the presidency itself has been permanently altered versus that he's conducting himself differently in the immediate. So. Great. Um, one thing I did not mention is that if professors start to go over their time, I will be signaling to them like this to wrap up. Um, although great so far. <laughs> Good. Um, but connected to that, one way that he's speculated to be altering the office is in his neglect of public opinion. Taking into account how far he is into his term, he has historically low approval ratings. According to a Gallup poll released two days ago, he is at 54% disapproval and is pursuing statistically unpopular policies, such as the border wall, which is supported by 28% of the population. How much should public opinion really matter to a president? 
How much does it or should it? Should it. Oh. Well, now, nah. <laughs> I believe that every president wants to leave uh, some sort of a legacy uh, behind. Uh, every president uh, wants to remember by uh, historians as well as observers of uh, American <coughs> politics, uh, as well as uh, the larger uh, electorate. Uh, as someone who's been uh, an effective person in, in the office of the presidency, someone uh, who has uh, uh, implemented certain policies, someone who has fulfilled some of his or her campaign promises. Uh, certainly in uh, modern uh, uh, politics, uh, uh, we come to value uh, public opinion uh, polls. Certainly public opinion does matter in a democracy because uh, political leaders and policymakers uh, also depend on public opinion polls. It's, uh, it's, it's designed as a form of providing some sort of a feedback to policymakers to measure uh, uh, the, the, the course of support that they would be getting from their constituents. So certainly public opinion does matter. Now, uh, of course, uh, the perception that a president has of public opinion may vary from one person to another. Uh, some presidents do rely heavily on public opinion polls. Some don't. Mm. But there's also a group of political scientists who now question the, uh, the scientific uh, <laughs> ability of uh, public opinion polls and survey research mm. to convey precise information to policymakers, as evidenced by the public opinion polls conducted in the 2000 presidential elections. I think everyone was quite baffled sure. by uh, by the uh, public opinion results. So, again, th it does uh, have some relevance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm a, I'm going to take some strong exception to what Dr. <laughs> just said. <laughs> But before I do that, but it's a separate topic. Sure. And so uh -oh. I want to go back to Alexis's question. All elected officials in a democracy should be mindful of, of public opinion, right? And so public opinion does play a role. But part of the role of a leader is also to lead the public, to figure out where they believe the country should be heading. And even if you have a reluctant public uh, listening to you, to try and bring them along. It seems to me that what's happened thus far is that what Donald Trump has done is he's worried about a particular segment of the public, and that is the people who have supported him. And this, is, I think, is problematic. So if the approval ratings that Alexis was citing, 96% of the people who voted for Donald Trump still support him and would uh, vote for him again. Right, and so the first question is like, what is his obligation? Is it to his supporters, the people who got him there, or is it to the country as a whole? And I would say each president goes ahead and tries to balance that out. Early in an administration, usually presidents are feeling a sense of goodwill and trying to expand their base. That is not what Donald Trump has been doing. And then the second point, not the part that I disagree with, we'll save that till later, is that Professor Mosley, Dr. Mosley made a good point. It depends on what the president thinks about public opinion. Mm -hmm. In other words, where he goes for information to find out what the public thinks. And we have a lot of at least anecdotal evidence to suggest that Donald Trump gets his information from watching cable news, primarily Fox, CNN, and maybe sometimes MSNBC. And so if he doesn't have people who are bringing in actual information then the problem is whatever he thinks about public opinion, it's going to be based on bad data, poorly uh, uh, collected data. And so that, I think, is the bigger problem, is where is he getting his information from uh, that, that, or that he's using to guide his decisions? Uh, let me just uh, uh, restate what, uh, what I want to say as a matter of fact, and that is that presidents are expected to be the leading formulator and expounder of public opinion while sitting in office. But again, it depends on the perception of the president and how he perceives public opinion and whether public opinion is relevant to the task that the president uh, has. And uh, of course, uh, first and foremost, I think we need to establish one important fact, and that is the president has to have a vision. The president has to have 
uh, certain policy skills, including uh, knowledge of public policy. The president must possess other qualities. This is important, the quality of exercising judgment, policy judgment. And again, it depends entirely on the personality profile of a president and how sophisticated they are in their perception of uh, policy issues. Well, I think uh, given the, the, the upset that happened in the, in the election and how so many polls got it wrong, and how you know, we were sort of a lot of people were surprised by the outcome, and I think that gives this president a little bit of, uh, he's got this uh, chip on his shoulder now about polling. Even if the polls are showing this huge disapproval rating, all he has to say is, well, the polls got it wrong in 16, and therefore we shouldn't trust these polls. And that's not, in, that's not a great way, that's not a, a great way to govern necessarily. And if we go back to, uh, you know, pulling after the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, and when it became unpopular in 2006, and uh, Congress switched hands to the Democrats, the, Dick Cheney was asked by the hard-hitting reporter Katie Couric, um, about well, we have this. That was a joke, by the way. Yeah. We have this. I, got uh, it. I heard. I heard. The panel yes, got it. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, he's, she said, you know, there's something like 60 percent of the public disapproves of this war, and his response was, so what? That I mean, look it up, right? He said, so what? Basically, inferring that we know, we know what is best for all of you, and therefore we should be able to make the decisions. And that is a really dangerous line uh, to sort of cross. And, and if that is, is ha if the presidency is built on that attitude, um, and, and if people aren't getting involved, you know, then, then that's how decisions are going to be made is, well, we know what's best for all of you. Therefore, this is how we are going to decision make or how we can respond to these things. So uh, I mean, I think obviously the public has to take an active role in projecting what it is that they want. Uh, otherwise, yeah, then we would rely on what the president sees, sees on Fox and Friends or CNN. So uh, we have to be careful of that, I think. I thought for sure Phil was going to bite at the insult paid to survey research, but he didn't. So <laughs> no, no, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Oh, you're waiting. OK. Uh, so I will skip that. But uh, I, I will say what I find distressing about how, uh, how uh, President Trump looks at uh, public opinion polling is that he, he seems to view it through the lens of it's all about me. So if he turns on the television and somebody is reporting a poll that views him negatively, he flies into a rage, goes into a Twitter storm, and then at 3 a.m., of course, because uh, that's what you want your president doing, and so there, and, and then and then goes into this defensive tirade about uh, fake news and all this other kind of stuff instead of just you know, letting it go, let Sean Spicer handle it to the extent that he can handle anything and, 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 and kind of let that go. But, but what he, he's, he's sort of coming off as uh, myopic and visionless, as someone who doesn't have a clue what he's doing um, and ignores public opinion because they might say something nasty about him. So without a vision, being completely ignorant of public opinion, Putting yourself in this little bubble uh, and trying to govern that way is is uh, dangerous. So the question was, should should right should uh, public opinion matter? And and of course it should uh, to some varying degree. Bill Clinton was largely taken to task, rightly so, for relying on public opinion polls too much, even to determine where he should vacation and what would make him more popular with the American public and things like that. Um, JFK commented on the fact that, um, you know, to, to kind of abdicate your judgment, your own judgment is to abdicate your own leadership. So there's a happy medium. Uh, what's interesting about this president is he has said, and I do believe with this statement, it is said that he's our first president that doesn't have an ideology. And I don't necessarily mean an ideologue, right, or that he's ideological, that he doesn't have an ideology, which kind of translate in, translates into he doesn't have a vision. Um, and some people try to uh, as assert that there's some organized chaos, right, um, to his impulsiveness that uh, Dr. Morioni was referring to. 
I, I just don't see it in, in that sense. What's interesting is, as a populist, you would think he would pay attention to polls, but then, as Dr. Gussin pointed out, he pays attention to certain polls and to certain segments of the society. So it's very selective, which gets back to what is most important to him. And what's so interesting, and I just heard a commentator last night on television say, and I completely agree, which is, you know, the Republicans themselves are waiting to celebrate, right, with legislative victories and otherwise, but they can't because he somehow or another is squandering all of this political capital he has because of his impulsiveness or his, you know, personality defects, whatever you want to say, that he isn't able to cohesively put together something uh, with both chambers of Congress in the hands of his party and, and having somehow or another this ability to dismiss any criticism and get away with it. Uh, and so in that sense, what I think is interesting is, is, is his, his kind of, you know, that he's not really paying attention to the polls, which tells you like, well, what does he want to do, right? What is, he, what is important to him in terms of his success and his achievements? Because he has to find a way to build relationships with his own party, forget the Democrats, just with his own party. And so I think as it relates to should it matter, I think it should to him more than it does because he lacks that government experience, he lacks that vision, and he shouldn't be ruled by public opinion polls, but he, he certainly needs to somehow or another have some, a more cohesive approach because in reality he could have, and to a certain extent, literally or metaphorically, the world in his hands mm. um, if he had, uh, whether you like that or not, uh, wh if he had uh, conducted and if he conducts himself differently. Right, politically. Okay, and then do, I, do I have two minutes for <laughs> it? one minute? For one, I have to defend public opinion polls in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in you. Minute, a minute, pardon me? I believe in you. Just tweet it out. Do it, Phil. Phil, yeah. yeah. do it. We're okay, going one minute. 150 one, one characters. Minute. Okay, wait, I'm watching the clock right now. Okay, so here's the first thing. In order to go ahead and do <laughs> public opinion up. polls, what pollsters do is they try and identify likely, likely voters. voters yeah. And the way they do that is they ask a series of questions. But the way that we identify likely voters frequently has to do on past behavior. The problem in this election is a lot of the people who came out to vote were new voters. And so the method that we use by, to screen who likely voters are to try and predict the outcome of an election didn't work. That's not because polls don't work. That means that our method of identifying likely voters wasn't, didn't fit here. So what needs to happen is not that we go, polls no, don't work, we, let's throw them all out. We need to modify our methods, improve our methods, which is something that political scientists are doing constantly. So throwing out polls is throwing out the idea that random sampling works and it works. The second thing that happened with the polling, and I hope I'm close, is that as many of you know, 11 days before the election, uh, the FBI director, uh, went ahead and announced that Anthony Weiner uh, had a laptop and there were emails on it that went ahead and were uh, sent to Hillary Clinton and so they had to investigate it. So 11 days before the election, do you guys know who Anthony Weiner is? I don't need to describe Anthony Weiner. Okay. So 11 days before the election, he says, we've just found all these, um, all these emails we need to look into it. We need to reopen the investigation that had been closed before. And so what? Uh, and then it turns out, and this guy Nate Silver did this analysis, all uh, the people who were undecided in the last week of the presidency, um, I hear you, um, <laughs> broke overwhelmingly for Donald Trump, in large part because of the suspicions that were raised as a result of that laptop. The polls wouldn't have picked that up. Right? Now, I'm not apologizing for the polls. I'm just saying, Polls work, but they're not perfect. Let's not throw them out just because they don't work all the time. But, but, but Comey's comments, I don't think, oh, okay, can I? Comey's <laughs> comment had little impact on Hillary's loss in the last presidential elections. It did have some impact, but it was not the only reason. I believe that the, the issues are more, much larger than simply a statement issued by the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. According to, according to Nate Silver, <laughs> the undecided voters in the last week, who decided in the last week of the election, broke 60-40 in favor of Donald Trump. <coughs> Anybody who thinks that that's not significant in an otherwise close election in certain states that were very close, I just have eyes, I would dis disagree. I think there are people who don't like Hillary Clinton, and for good reason they don't like Hillary Clinton, and they want to blame her for the loss. That's all well and good, but. We gotta look, as political scientists, we have to look at the data. 
And what the data shows is that there was a huge and unprecedented shift um, towards Donald Trump in the last week. And the most amazing thing happened. An FBI director announced the opening of an investigation that had something where the media kept getting to repeat Anthony Weiner's name and telling that story over and over again. I do appreciate data, however, there is a qualitative aspect to human behavior when it comes to voting for candidates. Bear in mind that millions of Americans in various parts of the country have long been disenchanted with the status quo in Washington. And therefore, they search for an unconventional candidate by the name of Donald Trump. And apparently, because of whatever qualities he possesses, he managed to appeal to those voters, and he won the presidency. That should not be discounted. However, I do appreciate data. That's important. Yeah, one more bit of data, nope. and then I'll stop. <laughs> last, last piece of data. The last piece of data. And this is the easiest data. You don't even have to do any division. Three million votes. Yeah. Okay? Three million votes. More people voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. Doesn't matter because we have the Electoral College. And, and, and I'm one of those people who thinks the Electoral College actually does some good things. So I'm not one of those people who thinks we should abandon the Electoral College. Leaving that aside, the idea that she was a dismal candidate and didn't have support, there's just, to me, the votes are the votes. And so I'll leave it at that. And we'll Great. <laughs> come back for the 200 day debate. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we did go quite a bit over on that. So I'm, I'm only going to be able to accept one table. question. But does anyone have anything yeah. that's just burning that they want to ask that hopefully won't reignite that? <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? OK, yes? Well, I just have a question with Hillary's comment about her losing the campaign based on misogyny. Well, I mean, I think any female candidate is judged by a different standard than a male candidate. I mean, I just think that that's baked into the cake. But in many ways, that's something that she's going to face and any female candidate is going to face. And so if you're not prepared for that, you're not prepared to run for office. And she I mean, had unfortunate sorry. fact. And she had three. She had Comey, Russia, and misogyny. So you know, there's like, evidently there's a combination of the three. That but, but I also have to say that in Hillary's case, it, it, there are so many variables mm -hmm. impacting sure. her loss and her candidacy that um, if you look at any subcultural group or sub pocket of American culture, um, any of those variables are going to bear out to be true. Um, which variable was the tipping point? I mean, that, that is. There are so many issues related to, to Hillary Clinton, it, uh, even if some of them are not necessarily fair, right? Uh, there's just so many that it is, you know, it's hard to unravel that. Yeah. And in fairness to Hillary Clinton, and believe me, those of you who have had a class with me know that I am not in the habit of defending the Clintons <laughs> um, no. or Donald Trump. Uh, but I will say, that in fairness to her, she, when she gave the speech, she didn't say it was just because of misogyny. Sure, she yeah. said it was a factor, mm -hmm. and she cited the Comey investigation and other things too. So she said it was a factor in the election. She didn't say it was, it, it hung on this factor. Right. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Thank you guys for doing so well with that question. Um, so, Trump has been consistently trying to warm relations international strongmen with controversial human rights records, such as Russian President Vladimir Putin, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, and Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte. <coughs> Do these alliances offer tactical or regional advantages to the United States? Oh, I think in the case of Duterte, I think that's what he's hoping is going to happen. Uh, the conversation he had was, I guess, a sort of lukewarm invitation to come to the White House. Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. With the sort of uh, the final outcome is being uh, giving him a little bit of leverage, um, but uh, I don't. I, I was talking to my class about this earlier. I don't know if President Trump thinks that far ahead. I don't know if that's the chess game that he plays. Maybe his advisors do, but um, I mean, that would be pretty incredible if he's looking at the Philippines as a piece of leverage. That, that you know, I don't. Uh, and I don't think you can ignore the human rights violations in any of those countries in order to, uh, you know, get some sort of uh, deal somewhere else. I don't think that 
there's, there's some there's some analysis that the uh, Philippines don't really have much of a relationship right. historically, right. obviously with North Korea to help to help out. So what is the vision right. of doing that? What's interesting about um, Donald Trump's kind of remarks and his embracing of these various leaders is that anyone that studies American foreign policy, foreign involvement, entanglement over the past 80 years understands the United States tacitly supports all types of strongmen. They support them with all types of covert and overt aid uh, from a political realist kind of cost benefit analysis. Um, we cited Saddam Hussein was our friend. Okay, he was our friend, uh, you know, uh, Donald Rumsfeld shook hands with him uh, after, you know, of course, all of this is knowing that he used chemical <coughs> weapons on his own people. So, so what's interesting about this, this kind of question and what people are talking about in the news is, is that Donald Trump is brought to the forefront of what kind of just goes on in everyday practice in American foreign policy throughout decades to varying degrees or another. Um, and so the question is, is that, um, is, it, is it tactically good, right, um, to in fact do this? Is he aiming towards some foreign policy uh, achievement or some triangulation, uh, maybe that his advisors, maybe not him, have kind of thought through? Um, and if so, um, it, you know, is it about time that America takes ownership and stock of its behavior? Um, with all types of scrupulous leaders uh, uh, around the world overtly. I don't want to give Donald Trump too much credit because of the fact that I think he's so impulsive and I don't think there is a long-term vision, but I also think if, again, back to my previous comment, um, I think he said it would be an honor to meet with the leader of North Korea, um, and maybe that offends certain people, but what's interesting is I have a feeling someone's kind of whispering in his ear 1972 Nixon. Um, and, and the idea, can you imagine, and I can actually, can you imagine Donald Trump actually saying, I have the protection of America under my control and I literally am gonna go meet with him and it's okay. And somehow or another building some odd relationship that makes everyone feel more comfortable that he, that state is not isolated. I don't think that there is the wherewithal to do that, but it's just this idea that I'm wondering if that is, that would, that would be the coup of all coups in foreign policy. Um, but again, I'm projecting way down the road. Well, let me, go ahead. Go ahead. Let me <coughs> offer my observation with regards to uh, President Trump's foreign policy. As we all know, one of the chief responsibilities, both uh, constitutional and otherwise, of a sitting president is that he's our nation's chief diplomat. And as such, he has prime responsibility for the conduct of American foreign policy. The United States is the most powerful actor in international relations by all measures, scientific, military, economic, and wealth. Uh, certainly, uh, at this point, uh, perhaps it's too early, I. I'm not in a position to determine the course of American foreign policy uh, under Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind everyone that the president must have certain skills to lead the country forward. One of those skills is to have a vision and also knowledge of complex issues relating to foreign policy. Uh, so frankly, I don't know where we're heading and, and why. And that is something to, uh, to be determined, and only time will tell. Also, another note that I'd like to add is that uh, it's, I'm so uh, disappointed to, to take note of the fact that some of the uh, key positions in the area of foreign policy have not yet been filled. And that greatly impacts the course of American foreign policy. Not to mention the fact that Secretary, Secretary of State Tillerson comes from a corporate background and he's not exactly an expert on foreign policy matters. So uh, to this state, uh, it's really difficult to um, sort of measure uh, the course of American foreign policy. And another thing that the president needs to be mindful of the fact is that he must engage in effective communication. You know, effective means of communication in foreign policy and diplomacy is absolutely instrumental in policy execution. Otherwise, you would be sending mixed messages and signals to the rest of the world. And we understand that foreign countries and their leaders may react in a certain way. 
So that is crucial, and I think uh, those who uh, have surrounded the president in terms of his foreign policy and national security team, they really need to um, uh, sort of uh, inform the president that these steps must be taken into consideration. To include our allies, which is oh, absolutely, the allies are concerned. Allies, they yeah. don't know what to rely upon. Yeah, and to build off of Dr. Mosley's comment, um, talking specifically about the invitation of the president of the Philippines to come to the White House, I don't know how familiar people are with um, President du what is it, Duterte? Duterte. 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 So he's been engaged in an anti-drug campaign within the Philippines, where essentially there are no trials. They find suspected drug users or dealers, they go ahead and they shoot them, and uh, in some reports they take a piece of cardboard paper and write their alleged crimes uh, on them and just leave them there in the streets for people to see. So this is who we're talking about. Getting back to, to Dr. Mosley's point, in the State Department, the State Department is like a ghost town. Usually it's filled up with people who are specialists. Specialists within certain regions, specialists on certain issues. And so if the president is going to go ahead and he's going to take a phone call from the president of the Philippines, what he does is he confers with the people in the State Department. They talk about this vision that we're talking about, where we want to go um, in our relationship. And that guides the president in his discussion. The State Department is basically empty. Rex Tillerson is still learning the job. And President Trump gets on the phone and talks to him and relies on his gut to go ahead and say whatever he's going to say. I'm sure the people who are in the room are just as surprised as everybody else when they say, did he just invite him to the White House? <laughs> right? That's the way things going. And that's a problem. The, the reality is, is that being president is an incredibly complicated job. And uh, international relations and foreign relations is an incredibly complicated thing where nuance matters a lot. And what we have is a president who not only has no nuance, but sort of um, looks down on nuance. He's all about, let me just be, uh, make, say the most bold, blustery thing. Thus far, that has not caused a major problem. Thus far, there's been no major miscommunication that has elevated a crisis. But that could happen. And so my hope is that the people around him start to fill in these institutions to provide him with the kind of guidance he needs so that he's always going to be a guy who relies on his gut, and that's fine. But he needs to have more of a scaffolding around him about where American foreign policy is, what our direction is, what our plans are, what our goal is, what our vision is, and what we're trying to accomplish. And right now, that's missing, and it's scary. Yeah, and I don't think we're likely to get one, because uh, I, 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 I don't think he has any idea what he's doing, and, and he's, he's having a lot of people, especially at the State Department so far, who really don't know what they're doing. And you can see this uh, buddying up to dictators around the world is not helping our image, um, and it's not winning us any friends either. Um, and. You know, the rest of the world, in terms of foreign policy, seems to be playing chess, and he's mm -hmm. barely playing checkers. So I think, I think uh, something else that's, that's really concerning is the, the dictator thing does worry me. I mean, Duterte and, and you know, uh, Putin and, and, and everybody else, he's, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un, all the other uh, uh, st uh, strong men that he's smiled on, but it's not just that he smiles on dictators who are currently in power. He's smiling on would-be dictators, on people with a strong fascist streak. What really worried me last week was when he started expressing support for Marine Le Pen, who is running for president of France. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to code it. That lady's a kook. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and I, I'm telling you, like, she's, she's a national front candidate. She's an official fascist, okay? Her father was Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was a straight-up fascist, a Holocaust denier, and a straight-up anti-Semite. And this is who Donald Trump is expressing support for in the current, the French election that will be decided on Sunday. So, uh, I think we need to see a little bit, as, as Professor Gusson pointed out, we need to see uh, a little bit more nuance here. We need to have some specialists at the State Department who know what they're doing. And we need to, 
break all of the communication devices that Donald Trump owns so that he does, is not able to tweet out support for lunatics and dictators. I actually want to change the topic to something you just touched on, the French election and that nationalist push. Um, but given Brexit, Donald Trump's election in America, Geert Wilder's defeat in the Netherlands, and Marine Le Pen's upcoming election battle in France, it's apparent that the jury is still out on nationalist populist candidates. So. Regardless of whether they're successful politically, the base still exists. Should governments be wary of growing nationalism, and how should they respond to that, if so? Can I take it? Yes. I'll go first. Because you know what, I think there is actually, um, going back to, to something that the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard uh, identified in the 1990s, that you're not really seeing um, uh, coherent ideologies battling it out anymore. Since the end of the Cold War, there, there aren't hardcore sort of committed ideologies left. What you have is what Baudrillard terms system and anti-system. So there is the global economic and political system as it exists. We are all part of it. And then there are these forces that are trying to tear it apart because, let's be honest, it's weak. And that's partly because of, of the economic problems that globalization has left millions of people behind. And in our own country, that's also true. Um, and nobody is working on this problem. You know, that's why the president come out and say he's going to bring back all these jobs, which he is not going to bring back because he doesn't have a magic wand. And he's not going to bring back defunct jobs from industries that no longer exist. They're not coming back. They're never coming back. That's a fantasy. And so, but we're not the only country that's having this debate. This debate is very much at the center of the French election. So I think you're seeing some countries have drifted off into the nationalist direction. Ours has sort of stumbled into that, as did the British. And I think where you've seen some resistance is on the European continent, in the EU, where they seem to be putting the brakes on it. Where with here, Wilders was, was pretty soundly defeated in the Netherlands, and I can't really predict what's going to happen in France, but the polling looks like, and I, and I do believe that polling's important, um, and, and it looks like uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the, the centrist progressive who's running against uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, has a very wide lead in the polls, and he's expected to win um, pretty, by a pretty decent margin on Sunday. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, but it seems to be that in some places, people are, are willing to say, OK, this is really a fight between cosmopolitanism and nationalism. Right, the, the economic system that, that is in place around the world has left a lot of people behind, and it has not benefited everyone to the degree that we were kind of told it would. But does that mean you give up everything that's attached to cosmopolitanism? Do you give up freedom of thought and inquiry? Do you give up elections? Do you give up uh, people being able to practice their own faiths in, 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 in the way they choose? Do you give up those things uh, in order to follow this nationalist path that puts other kinds of constraints on people? And I think that's where we are. Uh, I can't really predict where it's going to go, but I think it probably depends on the French to save us all. Let me just say, I, I <laughs> want to say that I think that's an excellent analysis, by the oh, way. I just want to applaud you for that. And I don't know if I can add to it, in it with any better substance, but I do think the idea of system versus anti-system is very, very important. The, the post-World War II international system, Bretton Woods, you know, all of the international regimes that have been set up, um, to include the, you know, that you know, obviously other factors, the end of the kind of bipolar Cold War, um, and the system of power globally has resulted in a disparity of wealth, a disparity of opportunity, a disparity of life's experiences throughout uh, Western civilization. Okay, not just the globe entirely, but Western civilization. And I think what's really interesting, and I've mentioned in previous panels, that I think. This idea that uh, people that are nationalists or populist and, and pro Donald Trump, not all, but a huge segment of them are just unhappy with the system and they just don't feel like they're getting the, the benefit or the reward from that. And I, and I actually think not entirely, but in certain important ways, Bernie Sanders supporters and Donald Trump supporters, if they could just remove the personalization of the politics and the discussion, remove the name of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and literally talk about what they want out of their life, 
they would have more in common than they ever realized. And I think that kind of reinforces the notion of lack of necessarily ideologies, more so than just disenchantment with what sure. uh, has resulted from the international systems of neoliberalism and globalism in its current form. And so I think that um, I, I'm not sure anybody has an answer uh, to for what the new realignment of the system should be. But again, excellent analysis. And then um, I'm going to sort of bring it back to the United States. Globalization is not an option. It's something that's happening. And we're not turning it back. It's not going backwards. We're not going to break down into like 19th century individual countries that function on their own. That's just not going to happen. And so there is disenchantment, the disenchantment that, that has been uh, explained here. The question was, what should our leaders do? And the thing is, and I, I'll build off of uh, Professor Andrews' comparison between Trump and uh, Sanders voters, is what leaders should do is avoid identifying others mm -hmm. who are to blame for their disenchantment. And I don't care if the other are Muslims or illegal immigrants or bankers, it doesn't matter. When you go ahead and you find others to go ahead and blame for the problems that we're experiencing when they are incredibly complex, what it does is it leads people to go ahead and look for simple solutions to complex problems. So leaders should stand up. They should take, they should go ahead. This is a back to that question about public opinion. This is the time when leaders need to stand up and say, there are no easy solutions. I wish there were, but there aren't. These are the options available to us. This is the direction I think the country should go. And so I think we, globalism isn't an option. It is something that's happening. It's going to happen. It's happening in our lives. It's going to happen in your guys' lives. And the question is, how are we going to adjust to it? Um, I want to point out another important group of those other people. Um, China and Mexico are often vilified for stealing US jobs. When scholars and economists typically agree that automation is the real long term threat to US jobs, um, what can the government do to help America respond to this impending transformation of markets? Because it is impending and inevitable. Now. But, I mean, at first thing, uh, I'll just be brief and let other people talk. Be honest and say, this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. This isn't about illegal immigrants. This isn't China, as, Professor, uh, as uh, uh, Donald Trump said, raping our country. <coughs> it's way more complicated than that. It's that the, the technology is developing, and jobs of the past, many of them, aren't coming back. So how are we, as a nation and as a, as a society, how are we going to deal with that? What are we going to do? And if we're going to wait for the market to fix it, there's going to be a tremendous amount of dislocation in the process. Are we prepared for that? Back in the early 80s, uh, my former professors at the University of Southern California uh, taught uh, students uh, uh, about globalization. So globalization uh, was understood as a, a phenomenon that was going to become a reality over the next 35 years or so. And as we sit here today in 2017, we're conscious of the fact that, as my colleagues correctly pointed out, uh, this is a, uh, a, a trend that uh, is irreversible. Uh, but again, uh, to make things less complicated in terms of explaining to you the concept of globalization, the reality is that as much as we may want to try to blame China, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines and Mexico and other countries that have been recipients of American investment dollars, uh, we're just fooling ourselves. The reality is that it's precisely because of direct foreign investment by the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and other industrialized countries that China and other developing economies are experiencing rapid economic development. Imagine yourself as the CEO of a major manufacturing, OK? Well, back in 1979, you had your manufacturing plant right here in the States. But again, you were left with no choice but to reinvest or move your investments from the United States to one of those countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh. There's actually a Macy's city in Bangladesh. And all they do is that they manufacture products for the Macy's uh, department stores. So the reality is that this is irreversible. And again,
I believe that we are, that is our uh, CEOs, our uh, uh, top investors are responsible for the situation we're in. Look, this is the larger picture of globalization, but I would like to include capitalism as part of this. This is the highest stage of capitalism where there is no such thing as corporate America anymore. We're talking about transnational corporations, transnational corporations, Starbucks, Microsoft, GM, Boeing Corporation is now building commercial aircrafts in China. Well, who's responsible for that? We are. And therefore, for uh, Mr. Uh, what is the name of the Secretary of uh, Treasury, uh, Stephen? Uh, Mnuchin. 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 <laughs> Mnuchin. 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 For him to say that he wants to correct the problem, I think that's disingenuous. It's, 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 it's a statement of falsehood. You cannot be a member of corporate America, that is assuming that corporate America exists, and claim that you want to reverse the course of globalization and bring jobs back to America. It's highly unlikely that any of these big corporations would divest from China and other countries and bring those manufacturing jobs back to the United States. It's highly unlikely. You can email me in about five years to confirm <laughs> that. So what are the consequences for the U.S. if we do not adjust to that? Depression? A lot of unemployment. Bankruptcy? Yeah. So I, I, I want to make a few comments. Uh, maybe I can answer that in this. And that is the current, I agree with everything that's been said. The current pace of globalization is not sustainable. It doesn't mean globalization isn't going to be here. It's just it, it, in its current form, it's not sustainable. Um, technology has just outpaced politics. Mm -hmm. It's outpaced law, it has outpaced economics. The, we're in the middle of a technological revolution that is the beginning, and we're not even in the middle. And you know, just from a legal standpoint, legal Supreme Court or appellate court holdings, they just aren't happening fast enough to define behavior in society mm -hmm. as it relates to a lot of these new nuances and dynamics and so forth of, uh, as technology plays out in terms of civil liberties or what have you. But as it relates to economics and automation and politics with Twitter and Donald Trump and that connection with the electorate and so forth, it, it is just taking off and there's no stopping it. And so the question is, can these other systems that are in fact, getting back to systems, that are in fact necessary for positive human existence, can they catch up to that? And, and I think that, um, uh, you know, Dr. Gusson said we should be honest, and I, I, I don't disagree with that, but I have to tell you, I think, I think they're afraid to be honest with you, meaning leaders. I think they're really afraid. That, because uh, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Democrats, Republicans, they have apparently no plan to deal with automation. Uh, and if they do, uh, they're not rolling it out and they're not, you know, sounding the alarm bell. And maybe they shouldn't, uh, and I've mentioned this story multiple times in various forums, but there have been various meetings of European business leaders among their shareholders and, else, and, and others uh, where they have been asked, why haven't you fully automated your plants more than you already have? And their response was, is that if we did that, there would be social unrest within yeah. days because of the displacement of workers mm -hmm. and the economy w might very well collapse immediately. Mm -hmm. And so the full, just as it stands now, the full, the full uh, capability of automation is not even being implemented. They're holding back on it. A and so what should the government do? The government needs to, obviously they need to be honest with themselves and they need to ha have some brainstorming, but I'm sorry to tell my libertarian friends out there and else, uh, that there is going to, there's going to have to be some type of social, even if it's temporary, safety net to deal with displaced workers so that it doesn't fall in back into the uh, uh, kind of disenchanted, aggrieved group that actually cannot be retrained within their lifetime quick enough to make their life sustainable and meaningful as Americans the way the myth has told them that they have that ability. And that's true in other countries. So we are, um, we're at a moment where the best and the brightest need to get together and have a plan and stop being ideological and use the best of market forces and use the best of government forces, forces to get together and deal with the problem rather than digging in and being ideological. I think that's true because an, an, I was reading an article this morning about they were talking to this um, specialist in uh, 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 
addressing future job needs. Um, and he works, he, he would not be named, and he would not name the corporation he works for. And he said, they, and the question was, uh, what do you think that we should be telling, you know, the millennial generation what kinds of skills, because it's very clear that certain kinds of college skills that they've been told they need to have are not going to pay off for them in the future. Um, so what kinds of skills should we be telling them? And you know what his response was? Are you serious? What jobs? So yeah, okay. I didn't want to freak you out, but but that is but that's mass exodus. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that but that but I mean, keep in mind. Okay, so and I and I've brought this up before, and my students have uh, who've heard me say this a million times. But but you know, it just was last year, the year before, when Volkswagen produced that that factory for for manufacturing cars, a, a car plant that used to, it was like 10,000, 15,000 people, and now is run by five people. Because that's all they need to, most of those, those jobs that used to, that fueled the, the, the post-war boom for the middle class in this country, those jobs no longer exist. They're no longer going to exist. There is no way to get them back. And the only kind of future we're looking at is Fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer jobs. This isn't an American problem. This isn't, has nothing to do with China or Mexico. This has to do with, as Professor Amber said, this is being driven by technology. And it has outpaced our leaders' ability to adapt to it. We have to find a way to adapt to it. That's the real problem. And it's not ideological. OK, and then two quick points. And that is, if you're trying to get your mind around this idea of automation, just imagine what happens when they perfect uh, self-driving vehicles and all the jobs that get lost as soon as cabs aren't needed, as soon as Uber isn't needed, as soon as trucks delivering goods aren't needed anymore. Just with that one technological advancement, the number of people who get displaced and who are out of work as a result of that just skyrockets. Something serious to think about. The other thing is I know that the theme of this is the 100 days you know, of the Trump presidency. But if Hillary Clinton was president, everything that we just said would be just as true. This has nothing to do with Donald Trump. This has nothing to do with uh, who's president right now. These are forces that are moving on their own, regardless of who's sitting in the White House at any point in time. That is precisely why I propose that, as citizens, we need to be not only well-informed people, we need to become more better informed and also more active political participants, because this is the future of America we're talking about. This is the future of the world. And it's important for us and for our leaders to have a vision for this country, to have a, uh, a, a strategy, a, a grand strategy for the future. And we also need to instill a sense of appreciation for uh, America and protecting American national interest. I'm sorry to say this, but I'm of the opinion that many of our corporate executives, and I don't have any data to support my claim, but many of our corporate executives uh, have no sense of loyalty to America. Because to me, protecting American national interest is the most important quality that a person, a policymaker, must possess. And unfortunately, that is a rare commodity. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why a segment of the American uh, electorate uh, has become uh, more of a nationalistic uh, person, because they are now thinking, well, I cannot fight globalization. I cannot bring those jobs back to America. But what can I do? to protect my turf? What can I do to protect American national interest? And then some of these voters have put their faith in some policymakers, in some individuals, uh, who may not even have a vision for this country. So again, it's important for us to become civically engaged and pay closer attention to what is going on in the world of politics and economics. But unfortunately, 45 million of our fellow citizens rather focus on the Kardashians and keep up with that <laughs> group of I individuals. Wonder, <clears throat> sorry, just one. And I wonder, and this, uh, my comment is sort of a question to the rest of us here, but I wonder if we talked about the policymakers not keeping up with the technology, and I wonder if they just accept 
that there is going to be a level of unemployment that is just acceptable. I mean, I just wonder if they, there is no policy there to, to solve the problem. So they just assume, rather than them just not having a policy, they just assume, well, there is a level of unemployment that will just be societally accepted. And, you know, there are some people who aren't going to be employed. And so rather than having a, a policy to fix that, they just accept that there will be that level and, and make decisions based on that rather than having to come up with a comprehensive solution to, to all this. And again, I don't know, but I wonder if there's a level of acceptance that we're not really trying to figure this out. We just are going to ac accept that there is nothing that guarantees full employment in the United States. And be reactionary as opposed right, to proactive. Right. Right. So. Okay. Does anyone have anything to respond to that, or may I move on? Great. So that is very, very important, but I want to get to Syria before we run out of time. So um, just a quick rundown for those of you who don't know the details. It's been going on since 2011, and there have been an estimated 400,000 civilian deaths thus far. Donald Trump originally contemplated allying himself with Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad in order to fight ISIS. However, when Assad used a gas attack and killed at least 70 civilians, Trump declared his actions as something that cannot be ignored by civilized society and launched 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles that targeted the planes that had been used in the gas attack. So, is Assad's gassing 70 people recently or the 400,000 civilians dead so far worse? Why change policy and respond now? <laughs> When the problem is, is when you have the commander in chief who's going ahead and getting his news and his information instead of from intelligence agencies, but he's getting it from cable news, it's hardly surprising that seeing these images, which for those of you who saw the coverage, were horrific. I mean, they were just horrific. And so somebody who has no understanding of the complexity of the situation, no appreciation of the nuance and the complicated relationships uh, involved in Syria, the ever-changing complicated relationships in Syria, my hope is this is what happened. My hope is he was like, this is wrong, and I'm president. We're going to bomb something. Just and his military advisors, because he's got some really uh, seasoned men around him, General Kelly, General, Mc, uh, uh, General Mattis, they went to him and they said, there, maybe they spoke with one another, they said, he really wants to bomb something. What are we going to do? And they came up with this very limited airstrike on an airstrip where we're going to go ahead and we're going to do 59 Tomahawk missiles. We're going to warn the Russians ahead of time that we're coming, who are going to warn the Iranians, who are going to warn the Syrians so that nobody's there. We're not even going to bomb the airport, the strip itself, because it's going to be so easy to go ahead and fix again that that's just going to look bad. And so they said, here's your option, Mr. President. Go ahead, be decisive, do it. And he's like, that's it. We're bombing something. And if that's what happened, and I hope it is, then the system worked the way it's supposed to. Because somebody who has a tremendous amount of power, the commander in chief, was given information that sort of lit, took his sort of ignorance, for lack of a better way of putting it, channeled it in a direction where his ignorance couldn't do a lot of damage. And so what they did was they gave him an option to go ahead and, and respond where he felt like he was doing something and reacting to this. The reality is, is whether they're using chemical weapons or dropping dropping regular bombs, what's happening in Syria is a travesty, right? Uh, it's a travesty, not just because chemical weapons are, are being dropped, but because of what's going on there. And there is no easy solution that I can understand. Back, back to previous comments about the lack of vision or, or ideology, President Trump makes it very difficult to ascertain um, if it's impulsive, based on an, an actual emotional reaction to witnessing something on the news in terms of the victims of a chemical attack, if it's born out of advisement from people around him that have a political realist mindset of short-term gains, cost-benefit analysis, and so forth, um, and, and so forth. What you know, looking at other leaders, you know, whether it's George H. W. Bush, um, whether you know it's Richard Nixon, whether it's you know other leaders. When decisions are made, you tend to kind of uh, know or, or you feel confident that they have owned that decision. 
and, um, and I think, and, and maybe even why, part of a larger strategy. I'm not really sure, back to vision and long-term versus short-term goals, if we can feel confident about why, in fact, there was a decision to launch Tomahawk missiles, um, what, what was the impetus to do so. In terms of the, the, the system itself, you know, there's multiple systems. And I think it raises the question, which is, as the world's only superpower, right, um, post-Cold War, the question most Americans wrestle with, and they might not even have, you know, intellectualized it, is do they think the United States, by its sheer power, and it's what they would feel as its citizens, its moral superiority, American exceptionalism, and so forth, should in fact lead the world and make unilateral decisions about when to enforce these types of standards? Or is there somehow or another in the larger global system an acceptance of international law and how we go about making decisions of when the most powerful countries decide to take military action against another sovereign state, even if that sovereign state is broken into many pieces in many ways. So I think we don't know uh, with any president, but with this president in particular, was there a domestic consideration of politics? Was there a regional consideration in terms of an alliance um, or some type of recalculation of what might better the United States' foreign policy position? It's very, very confusing, but uh, again, I, for me, the bigger question for Americans is, do you think America should take, even if its own customary system of decision making is kind of leads us to this type of action, do you think that that's what America should do and be in the world, or do you believe in the post-World War II system of international law and collective decision making, um, which has never been completely solidified and agreed upon, but yet is kind of part of all of our generations that we've all been brought up and born with. And I think with Brexit and nationalism and a lot of these other things that are happening, these are the larger questions. I certainly uh, welcome President Trump's action in Syria. Um, of course, there has been uh, a vacuum of uh, power uh, by the United States in the Syrian conflict. Certainly, uh, the former president uh, is responsible for that vacuum. Certainly, the Obama administration did not propose a grand strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian conflict. And therefore, the, the Russians, as well as the Iranians and other actors in, uh, in uh, Syrian civil war uh, took a greater role in shaping uh, what has happened uh, in Syria. Uh, but certainly, uh, as much as I welcome President Trump's action, the military strike in Syria, however, I think the credit goes to the military planners, particularly the top uh, military commanders as well as middle range officers within the military establishment. I think they exerted tremendous pressure on the chief executive to finally uh, react, take action, and send a powerful message uh, to the Syrian dictator that uh, enough is enough. Uh, but again, uh, it, I, I'd like to go back to my earlier comments, as well as in support of President, uh, uh, Professor Andrus's comments, that I wish you were at the helm of the presidency. <laughs> uh, that uh, certainly we don't understand, as of now, what model of decision making uh, the president is following. Um, so that remains to be. Uh, to be seen. Sure, and I think uh, since then, since the bombing, there hasn't been a cohesive mm -hmm. policy in place, and, and so, which leads me, and I've spoken to students about this a little bit, uh, I mean, it, some people have been arguing the reason this happened at this time, because the question is why now, uh, some people argue that it, it was because to distract the public from the Russian investigation into the election. and. I mean, we know that this is stuff like this has happened before. Some people argue the reason why Clinton uh, bombed the Balkans with NATO was to distract from the Lewinsky scandal. So uh, I don't think that you can leave that aspect out of it, out of it, uh, considering what 400,000 people have died and uh, ha were, were being killed prior to this chemical attack. And, and the fact that there hasn't been more policy, more decision making since that particular bombing. So, uh, that, you know, I don't know, but I think it's something that we have to consider. 
Yeah, I think um, I wish I had the answer to this problem. I'd have a Nobel Peace Prize if I did, <laughs> but it, I don't. Uh, and and I think that's part of the problem that the Washington consensus doesn't either. And I think uh, Professor Hernandez makes a very good point about I don't think you can count out the fact that you know if, uh, answering the why now question. Um, you know, the, these 400,000 people were already dead. That country is, is a, 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 an active war zone. Why now 59 tomahawk, tomahawk missiles that did absolutely nothing, as Professor Gusson pointed out, didn't even hit the runway? Uh, so it, it looks like a kind of a PR move. You could just as easily make the argument uh, that it was a distraction, uh, as you could even say if you wanted, uh, that uh, because this is this is a, a rumor, a Washington D.C. rumor that that Donald Trump had no idea what was going on in Syria until Ivanka went and showed him gruesome pictures, and so so he could have likely uh, commanded the strike because it made Ivanka cry, and that's the only yeah, and that's the that. only kid who likes him of his. So so yeah yeah, and she's the brains. So so yeah yeah. So what so so if he gets upset, you know, about Nordstrom canceling her line, so we're gonna bomb Nordstrom now. I mean, so that's, that's, uh, there's no cohesive foreign policy uh, 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 coming out of this administration. And what worries me is that the, the Syria problem is only going to get worse and nobody has a solution to it. And this problem just keeps getting worse. And, and it's not simple enough to say, well, let's just yank Assad out of power. Okay, so do that, and then watch the entire thing fall apart, and it becomes a haven for, it's already a haven for ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and, and the Kurds have their own thing going on, and then the Turks always want to get back, and then the Israelis over here. Everybody has an ax to grind in Syria, and they're all doing it. How do we make it stop? I don't think anyone has the answer, and I don't really think anyone's trying to find it either. Well, as a major global power, the United States does have international responsibilities. Um, and certainly, uh, I would hold the previous administration also responsible uh, for a lack of uh, a cohesive policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Syria. And that is, uh, I think, uh, a major responsibility that the former president failed to, uh, to execute. Um, so again, we have to be mindful of that as well. I want to make one uh, just comment about the idea that the President Trump and is very provocative in many ways, and so sometimes there's this kind of fog and screen around uh, analysis and kind of just looking at things as much as possible in isolation as an, an American action as opposed to a Donald Trump action. So if I go back to Ronald Reagan, Grenada, and other military mm. actions, <coughs> if I go back to Bill Clinton uh, during the Lewinsky scandal, and, you know, I don't, it was uh, Operation Desert, I don't want to say Fox, that's a Rommel. <laughs> I forget the name of it. But there were, there were certain short-term military engagements that were questionable in terms of whether they had a domestic uh, attribute to them or whether or not they had short-term, if any, uh, positive consequences to American foreign policy. And so um, this, is, this is not uncommon in American history uh, to have these types of isolated uh, events. And um, it, it, in connection to Donald Trump's larger kind of uh, phenomenon, it, it just makes everything much more blurry for so many people. Absolutely. So we're going to move on to a different format now for a brief section. It is going to be only yes or no answers. Oh my God. So oh my. after we've gone <laughs> down the line of the panel from each side, you can take a 30 second position. So this is just really getting down to the principles of things. And it's only three questions, so we're just going to Is it yes or no, or we get 30 seconds? Right? Yes or no. And then once we've gone down the entire oh, okay. panel, one person wow. from each side, okay. whoever oh, feels okay. very much propelled. Oh, God. Oh, okay. So, Not me. Yikes. we'll start with Professor Andrus on the first question, and then we'll go the opposite way on the next. Okay. Okay. So, the first question is, does the government have a responsibility to provide some form of universal health care? Insure or provide? Provide. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I would change the word to insure. <laughs> the best I have I to say do. yes or no? Yes or no. You know that it's not in my teaching style. <laughs> it's uh, not in mine either, but you have to do it. I know. Uh, yes. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Are you buying time? Um, <laughs> He's buying time. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Yes. Yeah, so good. Um, does the government have a responsibility to provide some form of universal health care? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Okay. That was my conservative part coming out. <clears throat> so I'll let you begin, um, Dr. Mosley, since oh, you're me? on that side. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Go. Well, uh, the prime function of a uh, government is uh, uh, to be the manager of prosperity, economic prosperity for a nation. Uh, that's the answer. And if they fail to provide any kind of prosperity, uh, then, uh, uh, of course, people would suffer. Hmm. Who wants to provide the yes response? Not it. I'm, pardon me? I said not it. I, 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 feel, I feel compromised because I'm going to change the wording and I feel as though the government has the responsibility to provide access to affordable health care through and initiate that system of being implemented. And again, through the combination of market forces, government forces, or what have you. And in that sense, I think they have the responsibility to ensure gov uh, health care. But whether it's owned by the government as a single payer, single payer mm -hmm. plan is a different story. Sounds very complicated. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> is that a Donald Trump quote? It is. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, so the next question is, taking into account both Trump and John F. Kennedy's accus accusations of nepotism, is nepotism ever OK? <laughs> in, so starting in, gover with, in government. In government, right. in government yeah, yes. Yeah. Starting with Professor Gossett. Define nepotism. Um, uh -huh. The practice of those with power and influence of favoring relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. That is the dictionary definition. OK, good, good. OK, ask the question again. <laughs> Taking into account both Donald Trump's and John F. Kennedy's accusations of nepotism, is nepotism ever okay in government? Yes. It's A your definite no. God. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no. It's not ever okay. Oh boy. Right? <laughs> You guys have had more time to think. Oh my god. <laughs> um, no. No. Is it yes? Oh my god. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. Okay. Wow. So let's start with the yes question this time. Who wants to go? I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, pres pres presidents need to be able to surround themselves with people they trust and who will give them information and who will give it to them straight. And if a president decides that a family member is that person, providing that that person has some sort of qualifications, I don't think a familiar relationship should preclude someone from playing the role of an advisor. And then the no position? Well, in my judgment, it runs contrary to the basic principles of republicanism and representative form of government to which the founding fathers were committed to. That was very concise, thank you. Um, and the last question is, starting with Professor Andrus, is money free speech in your personal opinion? Uh, in, general, in general or as it relates to Within the context of government, is money free speech, oh, but disregarding the Supreme Court decision? Disregarding? No. no. The spending of money on campaigns is what you're really yes. talking about. Yes, campaign no. finance. So you're asking about the, the I'm basically referencing. The Supreme you're you're Court saying decision, Buckley versus Vallejo. Talking yeah. about okay. the Supreme Court. All right. Um, is money speech absolutely not? No. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> is, is Buckley speech? right or not? No comment. <laughs> so do I have that option or no? Decline to stay. Decline to stay. If I had known that, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you got to sit at the end next time. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Does someone want to play devil's advocate? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate, but I think this is bullshit. So. <laughs> if, if, if somebody has, we are in a democracy where all voices uh, should be heard. And if somebody has enough money, that they are, uh, and they want to use that to go ahead and express their particular point of view, we should be really concerned about going ahead, going ahead and restricting their ability to do so. Yeah, and you can solve that problem with public financing. Mm. 
Is that the opposite opinion? I don't uh, know. If my colleagues want to build on it, they can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think in, if you have a, a political system overlapped with a capitalist market-oriented mm -hmm. system, capitalism is designed to actually have unemployment built into it and sure. have disparity of wealth, and that means the ability of everyone to have the same megaphone is, uh, by design, impossible. Yes, I agree. Okay, and then for the last segment, before we go on to audience questions, I have a question for each professor that I know is tailored to your interests, to your specialties, and to what pisses you off. <laughs> so, oh, wow. I am going to start with Professor Gusset. How I knew that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so, given the extent of proven media bias, are Trump's assertions about fake news and fake media reasonable claims? Oh, two minutes, by the way. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's start off with the first part of that. Repeat it? Yep, no, just the very first part. Uh, given the extent of proven media bias. Okay, so let's start off with the idea of proven media bias. There are all kinds of people who go ahead and talk about how the, bi the media has a bias. Some people say it has a liberal bias, some people have a conservative bias. As somebody who has actually tried to research this, it is a very complicated thing to do because what you need to do as a political scientist to measure media bias is come up with an objective way of determining how do you know when bias exists. And then you have to quantify that and then you have to go ahead and evaluate that. And then if you're gonna talk about the media, let's think about what's included in the media. Think about every local TV station, every national TV station, every cable network, every radio program, every newspaper, every uh, internet site to talk about the idea that the media, this incredibly large group, has a ideological bias one way or another to me is absurd. There's one bias that drives all media. It's money. It's money. They all want to make a profit and so they market their products to people who want to go ahead and consume what they're selling. MS, uh, uh, Comcast owns both MSNBC and CNBC. CNBC is a very conservative station. MSNBC is a very liberal station. Why does Comcast sell to both, have an, a, a, a liberal one and a conservative one? Because they don't give a damn about ideological bias. The bank doesn't say, is this liberal money or conservative <laughs> money that we'll be depositing? All they want to do is they want to go ahead and make money. That is the primary motivation. And oftentimes, if you go ahead and you look at bias, it can be explained by market forces. So if you find out that the New York Times looks like it has a liberal bias, keep one thing in mind. It's in New York. Okay? So the people in New York are going to consume news that's going to have a more liberal orientation. Get, figure out what, what, how much the market is shaping a bias and then eliminate that and see what you have left over. Perfect. There we go. That was two minutes on the dot. Boom. <laughs> You're getting better. Molly UN. Pay attention. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, um, moving to Dr. Moriarty now. Oh god. Um, he's a political theorist. PS, he's the only one on the panel. So we previously in this debate discussed the cur current issue of polarization like how we're becoming very polarized within the American political system. How has political theory contributed to that? Or is theory the solution? Well, obviously theory is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, well, I, okay, so, so I, I think that, that we're not really dealing with, with political ideologies as they used to exist. And so I don't think that's what's really fueling this. I think, um, what we're really looking at in terms of polarization is more, um, it, it's not theoretical really, it's more, it's more about people and their teams. People like, mm -hmm. I, I want this team, it's, you know, do you, do you want the Dodgers or, or, or do you want the Yankees and, you know, who do you like better? And that, that seems to be what we're looking at. It's not really ideological. I'd say if people did get a bit more theoretical and uh, actually read things, uh, then, then, yeah, seriously, it won't kill you. So, uh, so I think if people read more uh, and, and a wide variety of things, as I tell students all the time, go out of your way to read sources that you are pretty sure you will disagree with before you even start. 
Go to it, look at it, find out where people are coming from so you don't live in a bubble where everything just refracts your own opinions back to you and you just live in a feedback loop. That's not healthy. It's not healthy for individuals. It's not healthy for a country. And so I would say, uh, if we had more theory going on, then maybe people would take uh, uh, a longer look at themselves and where our country is headed. Great. Um, moving on to Professor Hernandez. Uh, so according to a Wall Street Journal poll, only 26% approved of the president's use of Twitter. Agree <laughs> um, but those people agreed that it allows a president to directly communicate to people immediately. Mm. Should social media platforms like Twitter be utilized by presidents to communicate with Americans directly, or can that be unwise? Well, <laughs> I, it can't. It can't. I mean, we've seen that it's it can be unwise, but I think it, uh, it can also be used as a tool. Uh, Obama was the first Twitter president. It wasn't Trump. The way that Trump has used it uh, is obviously different in that he, you know, he creates foreign policy in 150 characters. The way that <laughs> true. The, the way the way that Obama used it was to tell young people to sign up for Obamacare. So it was a different sort of uh, method of communication that I think is is really important and is not going away. Um, certainly, the use of social media for consumption of information is is here to stay, and it will continue along this path. So. I, I think it is important, but yeah, you can't you can't formulate policy in that in that space. I mean, that is not again going back to nuances of diplomacy and, and policy making. You you can't use it that way. But I think it is. It, it, I mean, it's something like uh, sixty percent of eighteen to twenty five year olds use social media to get their news. I mean, again, that that is not going away. And at some point, you won't be eighteen to twenty five. But you you will continue to use that those uh, platforms. So it, it obviously it can be unwise uh, given our current situation. But I think it is a great considering how many people are out there tweeting and Snapchatting and whatnot. So okay, now moving on to Dr. Mosley. Uh -huh. um, Boko Haram, a Nigerian Islamist group, is currently the deadliest terror group in the world. Aid agency Mercy Corps interviewed 47 ex-Boko Haram members recently, and two of the most prominent reasons for their joining was because there was no better economic option and because it was their only chance for societal or economical advancement. In fighting terrorism, is bombing ever effective, or do we need to focus in on root issues in hotbed countries, like unstable economies and governments? Um, I would uh, uh, certainly take uh, the position that uh, it's the responsibility of all governments and uh, major actors that are involved in uh, uh, planning, uh, you know, economic policies to uh, bring about some degree of prosperity uh, to those countries that are, whose economies are meagerly developed. Uh, and certainly uh, the economic conditions uh, certainly paved the way uh, for certain groups or to start recruiting uh, for uh, uh, political objectives and uh, they can use violence uh, to achieve political objectives. Uh, certainly, uh, many of these societies uh, that we're talking about, Syria, uh, Sudan, and, 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 and Afghanistan, and many other countries, have been a <coughs> recruiting ground for various uh, uh, terrorist organizations. And to that end, it is important uh, for uh, the, uh, the civilized world to take on a more active role in bringing about uh, some degree of prosperity and economic development to these countries to create greater opportunities for employment to avert uh, situations in which uh, can produce uh, violence and, and become a recruiting ground for for terrorist organizations. Look, in many parts of the world, unfortunately, uh, there is a situation, the economic conditions are such that uh, ha have created a, 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 a situation known as economic destitution. People have become economically destitute in many of these countries. 
Uh, and that, that, that is one of the reasons, I think the prime reason, that uh, they have been uh, turned into a recruiting ground for terrorist organizations. Uh, and certainly uh, that is something that, uh, that the nation states might be mindful of. And then finally, Professor Andrus. Mm -hmm. um, many colleges have begun to uninvite controversial speakers like Ann Coulter and Milo Yiannopoulos and ban the use of certain offensive words on campus. Is the enforcement of political correctness on college campuses a violation of free speech and therefore the Constitution? Huh. Can, can you just read the second part again? Is the enforcement of political correctness on college campuses a violation of free speech and therefore the Constitution? Yes. I mean, it's a violation because political correctness is subjective. So based on how you're asking the question, um, if you're going to restrict speech based on the fact of what just generally offends or what is not popular at that time, generationally and so forth, then it's absolutely unconstitutional. Now I qualify that with the idea of, um, you know, is there some other constitutional basis perhaps in which um, a university or a college at that time can restrict the speech. And if that's the case, just like on this college, there's generally policies that regulate time, place, and manner. Not, they have to be content neutral. Um, but what you're referring to is not content neutral. You're talking about should people be restricted based on the potential result of their speech. And um, I absolutely think it's unconstitutional, especially if uh, the regulatory policy or what have you is so vaguely written that it allows uh, unfettered, you know, as we would say in law, um, decision making by the governing body to decide uh, what and what is not allowed to be said. I firmly believe that the way to combat dangerous, scary ideas is with other ideas. Um, and it is true that many forms of hate speech and so forth um, can result in uh, people being uh, persecuted socially, politically, and so forth. I'm not denying that. Um, but the standard legally is, is that it, are you inciting violence right then and there by your words? And that's a different level of whether or not you should be restricted. But to say that what you're saying is politically incorrect is a chill on free speech, and I don't accept that standard at all. I personally think universities and colleges are the repository of ideas, good and bad. Uh, and it needs to happen on this campus and others. Okay, with that, we are going to move on to audience questions. So we have about 25 minutes for that, so I will start with you. Um, I would like to know if any or all of you can name any or think of any positive repercussions that, can, that will come from Trump's presidency. So I know you guys all have a very critical opinion of him, so evidently. I, 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 I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> And I am not a fan. Um, one of the things that happened when he got elected, and this is going to be a sort of a personal answer, is my wife, like, panicked. She was freaking out. And I was talking to her, and I was saying, look, our institutions are strong. The framers created this system to go ahead and prevent any one person or group from being able to go ahead and do a, bu a bunch of damage. And so one of the things I talked about very, very early on was the extent to which what I would describe as a, as a sort of profoundly ignorant person being in the White House is that the other institutions have stood up and done their job and contained that. And so for me, while I'm concerned about the guy who's occupying the White House, I am, I am bolstered by the fact that the institutions that should rise up in a case like that have done so. The states have risen up, the courts have risen up, Congress has risen up. Uh, at certain times. Uh, uh, the bureaucracy itself has risen up. And so for me, that's encouraging because it means that our system can't be brought down by a person. I, I just want to say that I, I think Donald Trump uh, speaks about things that I would say are truths, uh, and often in a very untruthful way. And, and what I think a positive that can and has come out is chaotic as it feels for many people, and for others it doesn't, but uh, is this idea that um, the disenchantment with the establishment and the system is, is that many things are never discussed, right? Never, many things are never referenced. Um, and so he is so impulsive and he says things so often that in fact have so much truth to them, although they are reckless, 
whether you're tweeting out foreign policy or whether or not you've thought through, you know, is this going to get us to a better place by, by me being honest at this point in this way? I think there's so many things that the United States does internationally and nationally that most people don't ever take time to stop and think about. Um, that I think that, that there's a re-examination of what is truth, what is fake news, what is news, what is the health of the media industry, um, what does it mean to deal with unsavory characters in foreign policy and all of these things. So he's just unearthing all these politically incorrect issues for many Americans or doing it in a politically incorrect way. And yet, I think for generations, this country has avoided having the conversation about many things that he is kind of attacking. And, I, and again, I, I, I won't defend uh, because I think there is a danger to just kind of, you know, kind of this, this uh, you know, with that lacking vision, uh, just kind of attacking every institution. I, I definitely uh, am appalled at the attack uh, of the media as, you know, kind of the enemy. I think that's horrible. Uh, as a general statement, and I also think attacking judges as being incompetent is horrible institutionally from the presidency and so forth. However, within every institution and every aspect of society, there, there's so many things that we're not discussing, and I think he's forcing us to have these conversations. Yeah, I think we're seeing um, as a result, and for ironic reasons, um, an increase in, in what in political science we, we term civic engagement, where people are getting more involved and people are starting to care. Um, and so this might be a tough four years, but I think it might also be a growth period. I would, I would say, say yes. I would say certainly if he if he has a, if he has a second term, no question about it. I mean, what pre, like if you think about the choice of Neil, Neil Gorsuch, who I, I believe is 50 years old. Mm. I mean, one of the reasons that he was selected is not only does he reflect the conservative values that Donald Trump purportedly believes in, but he's a young he's a relatively young man. I know you guys are like, no, he's not. He's my dad's age, whatever. <laughs> but he's a relatively young man, and he's going to be around for a long time. And so that may in fact be the legacy. The Donald Trump's greatest uh, sort of impact is sort of the, the movement of the Supreme Court. So, but we'll have to see. I think to what degree it's a legacy depends on um, who else is appointed, assuming that he does get that opportunity, <laughs> because uh, whether it's Merrick Garland as some type of political uh, kind of uh, maneuver, uh, whether it's keeping everyone on their toes by not going back to a more conservative justice. Um, that, it, it's not that it won't be a legacy, because I think George W. Bush left the legacy of Roberts and Alito, but I think it will be a legacy. But if he were to go back, and if anyone's familiar with the Federalist Society, and he were to go back to the Federalist Society as he did with Gorsuch and say, give me your short list and I'll keep working off that list, and then he cements three or four solidly conservative originalist and textualists and so forth, um, uh, Supreme Court justices, then I think his legacy is much more solidified in the sense of what he did to, to uh, create a block, ide ideological block. And as a theorist, we love irony, I would say that might also push people to start talking about term limits on Supreme Court justices again. <laughs> 18 years, yeah, that's the proposal right now. Wow. So, um, as a skeptical Trump supporter, very skeptical, maybe former Trump supporter. <laughs> <laughs> That's very skeptical. Uh, his decision-making process, well, there's three major ones. Rational, and I don't see uh, any legitimate cost-benefit analysis. Government procedure, I don't see any uh, standard operating procedure that he's referencing, and, uh, and uh, uh, government bureaucracy. I don't see him with any qualified candidates surrounding him, providing him with the information that he so much needs. So what do you think his decision-making process is? I think number four it should be Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with the Ouija board. No, um, I actually think that he's like sort of it's something we've touched on, and, and, and you can maybe speak to this. 
I think he has, he's, he's a man supremely confident in his own abilities, right? Uh, even though he's, in my estimation, clearly not up to the task, but really confident in his own abilities. So his decision-making process seems to be a very singular thing. He listens to people, but ultimately he has such faith in his own ability to make these decisions that it's something that we don't really, we haven't seen before. Because, you know, we talk about a decision-making process, and it assumes that there's some rational steps that take place, and I don't see that happening. It's sort of like he has this decision-making thing that happens and almost and calling it a process um, maybe giving it too much credit hopefully what's going to happen for people like yourself that that what he's going to do eventually the, the group around him is going to grow and mature and provide him with the kind of guidance that he needs so that he can develop a process but absent that I think it's it all seems to be very sort of gut based that's my estimation. I, I, you know, business, you know, the art of the deal, his book, business is very bilateral, binary, yeah. and so forth. Business is vertical, right? And government's horizontal. And what he's realizing, and he does realize, as much as he simplified everything on the campaign trail, this is so easy, this is so, you know, all this thing. There's nothing easy about it, even with his own party. And I think that he, he does realize this. There is some anecdotal uh, investigative journalism that suggests that the last person in the room is kind of the most who he's been influenced by because he's so impulsive in that way. Um, so I, I don't think there's any probably going to be any long-term decision-making process. Um, what I think is going to happen is, and I think when he's done with his presidency, I think the books that come out by his advisors are going to be a good read. And they are going to be, I think they are going to be a good read about how they, as established cost-benefit, rational actors, managed him. Mm. And I think what's happening around him right now is a group of people that meet regularly. I have a feeling that they communicate regularly on how best to create a system of, de of decision-making that you know that he can operate under that he feels comfortable reinforces his sense of self and yet makes them a little bit more in control of what the output is from him i i really do think they're reacting to him and trying to figure out what what they can structure for him and and i, I just have a feeling there's a huge psychological component to dealing with someone who's so impulsive and i say psychological none of us are psychologists here but i will say that there's been some interesting investigation going on about uh, about his his own his own tendencies on the campaign trail, he would be on the other side of the country in his airplane late at night, and he would repetitively fly home to spend the night in his own bed in Mar-a-Lago. Okay, because he does not like spending the night in someone else's bed. Right? He likes his. It's it, it's true. I mean, this is what has been in, uh, kind of uh, reported, and that that what does that say about a two-week foreign policy trip? and his ability to make decisions, and if he feels like he's unnerved, and that he's quite lonely, that he's not surrounded by his family, which is great support to him. His wife's in New York with their kid. And, and so I think this decision-making process is largely one of managing his own psychology. And I don't mean that in terms of identifying a condition or anything, just the reality of who he is and what his needs are. And on the heels of that, I would say he strikes me as um, Machiavelli says in The Prince of Emperor Maximilian, who it just depended on who was the last person he spoke with, and that is how he makes a decision. And I think that's why uh, there has been a strong effort by particularly Ivanka and her husband uh, to sideline O'Bannon uh, because, because he seems to be uh, the, the kind of provocateur who gets some of these crazier ideas uh, floated out there. And so and really quick, if I could, I agree with Dave that there are these, these groups who are trying to, to sort of shape his, his decision making. But I think when the books are written, we're going to find out that there were three or four competing groups. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think that's true, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, of off of this question right here is decision making process. That seems to be most problematic. You know, as I've looked at it, and I, I look at his uh, business dealing with the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City, and because of the hotel business, and uh, from the get-go, that was a program failure in the way he purchased it and the way he ran it. And as we look at governance and politics and our approach from it at that point, 
Shouldn't we kind of look more towards, this is a business deal for him. He sold the biggest business deal of his life by getting the presidency. And while he throws all this fluff out here about civil war and the behind the scenes, he has started his campaign for the next election. <laughs> he has got $13 million in that, and that money is going into Trump Towers for rentals, and he plays golf in Mar-a-Lago, and, and his kids are going to get, uh, he put out a tax plan here where there's no estate tax, and it's a big business deal. And the governance and all this fluff in front of him isn't what's really what's going on. What's going on is he's making a fortune. Yeah, he is the first person to profit off of being president <laughs> while in the White House. Um, and, and you know, as a political scientist, I find that more than a little bit distasteful. But, but as an American citizen, it pisses me off that somebody is, you know, taking all these trips to Mar-a-Lago. I'm like, uh, you know, you could, that's why we have the White House, you know. Um, but but I, 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 think that, I think there's a lot of truth in where you're coming from, that this is, it's, it, for him, it's always about what's the next deal. And if I've found a way to make money off this. I could, a re-election campaign would be great for me. I can make even more money if I can get, in, uh, get a second term. Uh, but if I were him, I wouldn't uh, put money down on that. Well, I mean, also he's got the, he, you know, he got trade, uh, his trademarks are in China now. Mm -hmm. yeah. His daughter's got trademarks yep. there. These are worth a fortune. Mm -hmm. The New Yorker came out and said they had a business deal with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and they're trying to get that out. And I mean, this is all business. And we're looking at it from a point of politics and governance, and that's that's just the smokescreen. But I, I, I want to say, as it relates to conflict of interest, mm -hmm. I think, you know, Bill was saying earlier that the institutions have shown how resilient they are and so forth. And to an extent, I agree. But to an extent, I think that Donald Trump is moving so quickly, so differently than previous presidents that I, I, I think the public and, and maybe even the institutions themselves don't know what to do. Because clearly there's a conflict of interest that's going on in multiple ways, given his business holdings and so forth. And, and there just doesn't seem to be able to be a response to that and, and not as a way to be uh, reactive to him personally, but as a way to prevent and, and protect the institutions of American democracy themselves and the notion that what is okay and what is not okay from here moving forward. Okay, and the, so and look, the, well, can I, I'm can I ask David a real quick ahead. question? I was say, but do you think that, that really the only way to do what you're suggesting to protect it is to just invoke the emoluments clause? No, no, no. I, I, I'm not suggesting I know what the answer is, but what I do know is is that, that people generally uh, have not had to deal with this before, and he's such a phenomenon in terms of all the dynamics that he brings from his personality, his business, you know, all of that, that I think there has to be some type of um, a reckoning among various government agencies and so forth, not just the emoluments clause, in terms of... Um, um, how we deal with such substantial conflicts of interest, and if in fact they do threaten, uh, you know, the integrity of the office, um, how do we react to that? Maybe with new standards and so forth. And this will be a good test of this idea that institutions are responding, because ultimately, <coughs> it's going to be up to Congress to respond to that. So if they say this is a unique set of circumstances, Congress responds to everything slowly. Our system moves slowly. But, so I don't think a Republican-controlled Congress is going to do anything to put the brakes on Donald Trump right now. But it may be like when, uh, after Rosa passed away, they changed the Constitution to limit terms, that it may be that what happens is once Donald Trump leaves office, Congress will go ahead and respond and say, we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. And if they do that, if they take that action um, after, after he's out of office, it will again lead me to believe that the institutions respond. They don't respond quickly, but they do respond to new threats. And I think it's important for, for the public to understand that, there, that these in conflicts of interest exist. And among his supporters, it's not one of the things that they're worried about, which is frightening, because it should be one of the things that they're worried about. Um, and so I think it's really important for the people to understand that this is happening. Uh, I know it's, it gets pretty wonky in terms of uh, conflict of interest and emolument and all the rest of this stuff, but uh, I mean, it's, I think it's vitally important that we as the public understand that this exists. Next question, please. Uh, what else is, uh, so there's a lot of talk about uh, 
at least especially from the House Freedom Caucus, about a small government, a government that fits in your pocket. But we've seen across the world that there's been weak governments that clearly haven't worked and have left big power vacuums and lots of groups that have been formed. But we've also seen strong governments that haven't worked and turned into fascist, uh, fascist uh, regimes. Now, the question I have is, is there a fine line between a weak government and a small government? And is, is it possible to have a small government that still has the capacity to take care of its citizens? Mm -hmm. Nice mm -hmm. question. Hmm. I've, I'm happy to answer, but I, I've taken up enough time. I think my colleagues have. It, it's okay. Just a, just a quick observation. Uh, certainly, the uh, you know the founding fathers proposed limited form of government, and I think that has always been part of American political tradition, where almost every administration has tried to limit governmental activity. Uh, but certainly, there is a stark difference between having a weak government and a small government. Is that what you ask, a small or, yeah. or weak government? Right. And is it possible for a small government to have the capacity to take care of its people and right. or to maintain its uh, you know, power over its nation? But theoretically, you could have a small government, small governmental institutions, but they have to be run efficiently. And we do have uh, the capability, in my judgment, to run an effective uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and that is what some conservative political scientists have put forward. As a matter of fact, uh, there are plans underway to introduce a uh, form of federalism, uh, which they refer to as competitive federalism. And the purpose of competitive federalism to, is to embrace elements of uh, privatization. Uh, to make governmental bureaucracy more efficient. For example, you should expect a private agency providing the same services as the Internal Revenue Service in the next five to ten years. That could become a reality. Fire departments could become privatized. That's also a possibility. So there is that greater push toward privatization, which would ultimately make the government much more efficient. But the hope is to have small government, not necessarily a weak form of government. The, the idea of a, a small government is kind of connected to the idea of liberal democracy, right? That you have the government is out of your way and that there's these kind of individual freedoms that exist out there. And there's truth to that. But that's not going to exist because if you don't have a strong civil society, which are all the other non-governmental kind of organizations that exist and support um, society outside of government, there has to be other institutional development that, um, that, that is sound, that is fair and equitable, you know, whether it's market-driven organizations or other organizations uh, in a society um, that, that people that kind of reinforce the culture of ownership of decision making even if it's not government decision making. If you have a small government and you, have, you don't have any of these other institutions in place, it's not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole promise of liberal democracy is this idea that the government doesn't need to be large, theoretically, because you have all these other elements in place. Um, it, you know, if, but if the, anyone thinks that the United States can have a very, very small government anymore, they're mistaken, right? Just because of the fact back to technology, 21st century demands the 300 plus million people and, and that the demands that we as a country, a superpower, have taken on and assumed, whether you like that or not. And when you have this type of huge society, the only way to ensure that there isn't too much inequity that results in social strife and unrest is to make sure the government plays a role in that. And that's a fine line to, you know, where, where is the government overstepping its bounds and so forth, and how do we maintain that, that proportional relationship um, with government to its people? But this idea that we can go back to an agrarian society where the government is so small and so remote, right, that it's not going to infringe on our rights, it's just, it's just not possible. If the government dropped out of your lives right now, you'd all be very upset. Um, but uh, it can be limited relative to what its task, its fundamental task need to be in 21st century you know, America. And it can work in the United States because there are other realms for and institutions. But if there aren't other institutions, a small government will always lead to chaos. OK, and we have time for one final question, if you guys promise to be fairly brief. So does anyone else have anything to ask? Um, yeah. OK. Uh, so my question is just uh, with regard to the thing we were talking about earlier with mechanization and automation, 
Um, as a millennial, obviously it's concerning, you know, the amount of jobs that are, you're saying are Let's end on an up note. <laughs> uh, so my question is just, as, because politicians inherently play the short-term game, right? It's just how many jobs can we have right now, even if they're not sustainable, so that I can look good, so that I can, you know, get reelected or whatever, right? And that's inherent. But what can politicians do, aside from just acknowledging that it's real, what can they do to prevent mechanization from taking more jobs away from Americans and people in the world? Okay, I'm going to take a crack at that, but I'm going to change your question. It's not what can politicians do. It can be what, it should be what can you guys do? What should your generation do? And that should be to demand that they come up with some answers to that. To, because the bottom line, you pre the premise of your question was correct. When politicians make decisions, they make short-run decisions because they want to get reelected. So who are they worried about? Are they worried about most of the young people? No, they're worried about us. Why? We vote and we have money, right? You guys don't vote and you don't have money. And so they can, I'm just saying, and so they continue, nobody's having a discussion about whether or not we're gonna be out of work. We're gonna have work. You guys maybe not. So the only way that this changes isn't by waiting. You're gonna have work, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so, what you're, well, just keep going to college and you'll have work, that's for sure. The way it changes isn't for politicians to come up with solutions, although that should be part of it. It should be by you guys getting active, you participating, and you demanding from politicians that they come up with answers to these kind of questions. So, I would say don't rely on them. Go ahead, go ahead and insist that they come up with solutions that make sense to you, that look long range, that, lo that are looking out for your interests instead of our interests. I agree with that. As I said a couple of minutes ago, uh, as educators, it is our responsibility to make you better informed citizens. You guys are already very intelligent. But our responsibility is to make you better informed citizens. But ultimately, <laughs> you need to become active political participants. Remember. We inherited a great democracy from the founding fathers of America. Those folks had a vision for this country. They established a system of checks and balances, separation of powers, and we are benefiting from their vision. So in order to preserve this great democracy, there has to be greater popular participation as well as greater attention to public policy <laughs> issues. And just to piggyback on that, because if you don't do it now, by the time you get to the point where you're saying, this stuff is affecting me, it's way too late, right? So make it a priority now to get involved so that by, by the time you get to that point, you will have played an active role in the decision-making process rather than just saying, well, rather than just being reactionary That's because right. now, that, now it affects me. Yeah, well, um, I don't want to look at this through rose-tinted glasses because there is a lot of work to be done and I would also encourage you not to think of this just as an American millennial but to remember that this is a global problem and the solution is not going to be an American solution it is going to be a global solution and that means all hands on deck so that means that here you have to be civically engaged, as everyone else up here has said. And you have to think about not just your own short-term self-interest, because it's not just about you guys. It's about all of us. And that's the only kind of solution that's going to work. Yes, um, I agree with everything that's been said. I recently watched a documentary called Happy. And I know some of our psychology instructors show it and so forth. And it was interesting. And, and, and it talks about finding meaning and purpose in your life and what makes you truly happy. And one of the things that their studies had indicated was is that um, for the most part, um, being happy, truly fulfilled in a meaningful way is connected to other people. Like it's a sociological exercise of being involved, my sociologist over there, of being involved and making a difference in other people's lives and defining your self-interest as part of the larger whole. And that might, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, sound Pollyanna, but I think this idea of civic engagement and involvement through work and struggle comes meaning and enjoyment. Not always, 
but quite often. And I think this idea of the phones separate us um, in large part when we're sitting next to each other in restaurants just texting. And I think that if you find that you're working toward a sociological, which politics is sociological, goal and working with each other, you'll find great meaning in your life and you'll make improvements because it, it, the solution is global and it is among all of you because the politicians, and we're back to public opinion, that you have to force upon them and you have to bring to them the ideas. Otherwise, they, you know, they might not have it themselves in large part. Great. Well, I have one final announcement before we completely wrap up. Because um, that is the end of the questions, unfortunately. But we are actually hosting a whole other event in two weeks in this same room. It is a political science game show. We currently have three contestants, although we are still open to applications if any of you are interested. But besides that, everyone and anyone is welcome to attend. Same room, same time, same people will be here most likely. It's a club so event, right? It is yeah. a club event. It is sponsored by the Political Science Club and I believe co-sponsored by Model UN. So just know that you are all invited to that. And then on top of that, I just want a round of applause for our wonderful <laughs>